Listen, we're going to have a lot of fun with these two really brilliant men who are going to try to give us their best ideas about how to save our Sierra. The first is Gideon Krakow, which is a very wonderful and consonant-filled name. He's a lawyer. He was appointed to the State Mining and Geology Board by Governor Brown in 2014 and became the chair in 2015. He's a lawyer in private practice in Los Angeles, which we forgive him for. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that where he represents clients in civil law, environmental, and land use matters. So that's actually great. Isn't it great to know that there's a really smart lawyer down in LA helping fix civil law, environmental, and land use matters? In addition to his services, the State Mining and Geology Board, Mr. Krakow currently chairs the California Department of Toxic Substances Control Independent Review Panel, tasked with recommending improvements to the agency's permitting, enforcement, outreach, and fiscal management. He's also the former chair of the State Bar of California Environmental Law Section. And I think he was very surprised when we asked him to be a speaker on this. We didn't really ask him to come here and speak about any one of those specific things, but instead to try to give us his perspective on this intersection between toxics and mining and law and living in Los Angeles and helping us to think, um, think through things. And what I found about Gideon, we spent a day with him um, pretending we are a piece of gravel going backwards up the Sacramento River, back up the Yuba River, over the Englebright Dam, and up into the Malakoff Diggin State Historic Park. So Gideon um, saw what we have been seeing um, up where we live, and I found him to be incredibly eager to learn about the challenges that we are facing and very creative in thinking through opportunities and solutions. So welcome, Gideon. Come, come inspire us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that nice introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I want to congratulate you, uh, Izzy and, and Carrie, and your staff and, and board, um, all the presenters today, all the students. I've just learned a lot and always have really valued uh, our relationship. This is my first um, Sierra Fund conference, but it's not going to be my last. So, yeah, happy to be here. And it's nice to, that the State Mining and Geology Board is really on, on the big stage here. I was uh, telling Secretary Laird that all of you folks came to hear me, not him, right? Yeah, no doubt about it. So don't feel bad, though. It's OK. I'm actually happy I am going first, because going after you with all the things on your plate um, would be a bit anticlimactic. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. But Izzy asked me to run through a couple little things on a PowerPoint to talk about some of the work that we're doing at the board and also uh, at Toxic Substances Control. So this is just a short little PowerPoint that I'll run through very quickly. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the board. I was appointed, as, as Izzy indicated, um, in July 2014 by Governor Brown. Um, and the mining board uh, uh, looks at um, uh, the mineral resources issues, regulation and conservation, reclamation of mine lands. We also have a little bit of a role in geologic and seismic hazards. The Alquist Priolo Act have a little bit of a role there. Uh, we are within the Department of Conservation. Um, the board at, uh, at full speed has nine members. Currently, we have seven members with a broad experience from industry, uh, science, technical background, some lawyers like me. I'm actually the public member. Um, we're within the Department of Conservation, and a little bit there about our authority, which comes out of the Public Resources Code. And you can look us up online, we have a pretty good website that's hosted there by DOC. So you've heard a little bit about some of the uh, board's activities, and there was a presentation uh, today. But I guess the theme for our board is there's a lot that is new and improved. We have new mining laws. We talked about this uh, the presentation before, but in 2016, you've got a law uh, that really has changed the Surface and Mining um, Reclamation Act, uh, really reforming, bringing more consistency and hopefully professionalism um, uh, uh, to the law, really focusing on financial assurances, the inspections, the fees, and a little bit on the appeal. So that's a new law. We also, at the board, have a new executive officer. We're not a very big operation. It's about a million and a half dollar budget, about five staff, 
Jeffrey has been with us uh, almost a year, came from the State Senate, so he has a, not only a personal passion for some of the work that we do, but a lot of experience there um, uh, in the Capitol um, and very helpful to um, uh, making sure the board um, gets the resources that it needs. We also have a new board strategic work plan. Really the governor's emphasis here has sort of been back to basics. Really working on the governance of the board, professionalizing our own operations. I'll hit on a couple, three things here. The first is we have to do all the rulemaking on these new laws. The rulemaking is going to be on these topics, inspections, fees, financial assurances to make sure we can clean up these sites, and that's going to be a focus of our work over the next couple of years. The other thing is the designation of mining land. SMARA is a balance. It's a balance between using resources that we have and also reclaiming them. And part of that is what we call the designation process, which is making sure that the resources are there to be used to protect the mining lands and to make sure that they're not used for other uses uh, because after all, um, you know, our economy and other things depend on the availability of these resources. So designation protects those lands. Also our lead agency responsibility, the board does the mine inspections and reviews those plans for 42 mines, including in the Sierra. We have Yuba County and El Dorado County, there's 22 mines there. Finally, another new and improved thing is our improved collaboration with our sister agency, uh, the Division of Mine Reclamation. Um, the Supervisor of Mines, Pat Perez, is here. He's new too, it's been a couple years, doing a terrific job, and we really pride ourselves on working together well in the public interest. Um, uh, uh, the Division of Mine Reclamation oversees 22 lead agencies in the Sierras. Um, Lassen um, and Inyo are the, uh, have the most mines of the ones that you oversee. Switching gears very quickly to my other job here, where I am the appointee of the Senate Rules Committee. This is the DTSC. Um, a thousand people, offices throughout the state. They do permitting of hazardous waste sites, enforcement, um, site mitigation, uh, the, the cleanups of the, of the most seriously contaminated sites, and also a green chemistry, safer consumer products program. It's an agency that has some troubles. Uh, we have controversy around a, a very significant uh, 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 battery smelter called Exide in Vernon, California. A lot of environmental justice issues. $200 million almost of general fund money is going to clean up that site because uh, Exide's bankruptcy. There was also a state auditor report on almost $200 million in outstanding billing at the department. Lots of executive turnover, lack of consistency at the top, and also a backlog of their permitting. So, in 2015, Senate Bill 83 created a panel, short-term panel, to review recommendations about the department in areas like uh, permitting, enforcement, public outreach, fiscal management. We have to write reports every 90 days. Uh, you can look us up on the website, too. Uh, but these are sort of the contents. We talk about these different programs, make requests of DTSC, recommendations to the governor and legislature, recommendations to DTSC, Importantly, performance metrics. Talked about accountability and governance, and that's one of the things we're focusing on. So far, we've done seven reports on DTSC, and we're gonna sunset at the end of this year. So there are two sort of separate jobs. So what do we get from this? What are the building blocks consistent with our conference theme for a resilient future? What do you learn from what we're doing at the Mining Board and what we are doing at the Department of Toxics. So I've tried to distill some themes. Transparency. Uh, Mine Supervisor Perez talked about the emphasis that we have as we go through the regulatory process now with the SMAR reform on open communication, going out in the field, workshops, newsletters, really raising the profile of surface mining in this state, talking to all those lead agencies that are really the ones doing the work on the ground and talking to them about the mine laws, about the uh, reform, about the regulations. And I think that even just getting out there and explaining what we do, explaining the importance of the availability of mine lands and reclamation and a good, safe regulatory environment has tremendous value. And that's the same for the DTSC panel. The DTSC does not have a board or a commission like the mining board. So folks feel it's a very insular agency, as some of the criticism, whether um, um, real um, or perception. 
So the whole idea behind the panel was holding monthly meetings on DTSC's performance, going throughout the state, uh, 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 Central Valley, Northern California, San Diego, we're gonna be going to Imperial County and talking about the department. So getting out to the folks, uh, all the stakeholders, and trying to make these agencies more transparent, opening them up about what it is that we do. Along with that comes accountability and the performance standards. We talked to you about, from the mining perspective, our strategic plan with concrete steps and things that we're really hoping to accomplish, that each quarter in a public forum, we're gonna be evaluating what, where are, are we? What have we done? How far have we come along in, in all the steps in our strategic plan. And it's the same thing for the DTSC, trying to bring increased governance to that department. We have in each of these reports, and here's the latest one, all these different metrics, pages of them. Hopefully not too many, hopefully ones the department can manage and accomplish. But we're trying to bring some degree of accountability and performance standards that are measurable metrics to the governance of these two organizations. The third thing, so important, is interagency work and communication. In mining, again, this is a, a home rule state, they call it. It's not the state that permits all these mines or enforces all these mines. It's the local agencies, dozens and dozens of them throughout the state. It's essential that we here in Sacramento get out to those local areas, talk about um, uh, what the different responsibilities are, whether it's fe federal, state, or local. And on some of these mine cleanups, that's increasingly important. The same true for toxics. Take that Excise site, for example. You've got AQMD, the Water Board, the local permitting agencies. It's extremely important that there be interagency communication, um, and that is, without doubt, one of the building blocks we're going to see here for a resilient future. And we're seeing this both in the mine context and also at DTSC. There's a lot of similarities addressing the legacy issues. The Argonaut mine is a debris dam mine. Um, um, that the DTSC, it's a success story, where they just installed in 2015 a stormwater diversion uh, program there. Uh, but this is one of those legacy mines, threatens the town of Jackson there, I think, which is in uh, Amador County, or, yeah. Um, and these are issues that aren't gonna go away. The same with Exide down in Southern California, or Malakoff Diggins, of course, and some of the other legacy issues. No matter what, we're gonna have to pay attention to those try to prioritize them. The department and its staff is working on that as well. There's a lot of different agencies involved, federal agencies, state agencies, probably some things that can be clarified in terms of the different responsibilities. But we're gonna have to address these legacy issues. It's a lot of money, and we have to make sure that we don't forget those, sweep them under the rug, and that we do prioritize the most important ones. And along those lines, the final point I'll touch on that is a building block for a resilient future is learning from the past. What do we learn from Argonaut Mine, from Exide, from Malakoff Diggins? Why are we working so hard to professionalize the Smara statute? And it's really common things that you see both in DTSC and in mining. The need for financial assurances, which is probably the, the, one of the real key pieces of the mining reform. All throughout the state, all throughout the Sierra, making sure that the local agencies are planning for the future, and are setting aside the money needed each year to clean up these sites. And DTSC needs to do that better on its sites that it permits throughout this state. We don't want to have another Exide or Argonaut mine, and those financial assurances are a key piece of that. And if you look at our DTSC reports, one of the big recommendations is the department has to do a better job on that for its 118 permitted sites. Same thing, regular inspections trying to make sure that these local agencies are out there in the field, that we as the lead agency at the board are in, in the field, and the same with DTSC. There's a bill in the legislature which this, um, our panel recommended to require DTSC to put in, or this legislature to put in the statute, regular inspection frequencies for DTSC's facilities. Do you know that there is not in statute a, a um, a mandated frequency for how often DTSC inspects the hazardous waste facilities in this state. So there's a bill right now, I forget the number, it's uh, some of them in Colorado, and hopefully we're gonna have that in statute, why? So DTSC can be held accountable with performance standards. Hey, you have to inspect the mines on this frequency, 
so we're not gonna have these legacy issues in the future. And then fundamentally, with all these agencies do is reclamation and redevelopment. These are very, very challenging sites. We wanna professionalize those operations, make sure these agencies have the resources and the know-how, working with industry and all stakeholders to get, at the end of the day, where we wanna be, which is reclamation and redevelopment uh, for DTSC, particularly in the brownfields sector. So those are some of the building blocks, some of the distillation of the common work that I'm doing, that we're doing, um, and want to thank you for the opportunity to present. Not on. Now it is. A little shocking. So they don't, they don't require inspections, huh, Gideon? That's kind of shocking. So I, I, would just like to, um, I would just like to ask you, before we bring on our next guest, to, to tell us, why did you end up? I imagine these are fabulously well-paying jobs and that, that you're just raking in the bucks. Why did, why did you end up in these two positions, Gideon? I ask that question a lot. I imagine they're both basically volunteer, if I'm, I'm not wrong. I think we should just try to filibuster and have a, a Secretary Laird just sit there all night. I like that idea, because yeah. he's not used to that. No, I'm just We'll get you up here soon. In a minute. Listen, um, the, the, the governor called and the Senate pro tem's office called um, and uh, wanted to have the opportunity to, to uh, put um, into practice my energy for these issues and some of the experience that I have. You know, there's a long history of public service in my family. It's something that I enjoy. I enjoy sort of being in the arena on these things. And um, these were the opportunities, Izzy, that, I, that um, presented themselves, and I took them. I think we were really, really lucky to have um, th this individual serve as the chair of the mining board um, and also work on the, on the talks. It's such an unusual, and then bringing in the environmental side of the bar such an unusual combination of skills. And um, I really am grateful that we've had an opportunity to capture his energy and, and help us. Um, for those of you that were at the SMARA panel earlier today, they were trying to summarize all the changes to SMARA. It's like enormous changes, which I think come up with something consistent. But again, it seems like you're taking some of what you've learned there and are taking it over to like the idea of inspections and real it's just outrageous that Exide could poison everybody and then go bankrupt and leave. I mean, really? How does that happen? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, it, these building blocks we're just talking about, uh, um, you know, really, I, I think it does boil down to governance of some of these, you know, regulators. We have, you know, uh, uh, laws that are there and hopefully the legislature is putting in place fair laws that, that can be applied. Um, and um, you have um, the governor putting in place folks like Secretary Laird and Pat Perez and others to lead these different agencies. Um, um, and then you know, hopefully you have in place the priorities that you need um, to make sure that uh, these kinds of things don't happen. But fundamentally, you have to have governance, you have to have leadership, you have to have transparency, um, and then ultimately you know, accountability um, to the folks in this room and all the stakeholders. That's right, that's, that's part of what lawyers are, are for, is help us with accountability. Well, our next uh, speaker is somebody that I am um, so proud to call a, a, a personal friend. He served on the board of the Sierra Fund. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about him, no, I'm just teasing. Um, our next guest is Secretary John Laird. He's the Secretary for Natural Resources, who served um, since the governor was elected. In fact, the governor got elected, and the next thing I knew, I lost two board members. Um, he has served as the secretary since 2011, a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. Secretary Laird spent 40 years in public service at the state and local level, including 23 years as an elected official. While serving the maximum three terms um, in the assembly, Laird authored 82 bills, which has got to be some kind of record um, in, in just uh, six years. These bills established the landmark Sierra Nevada Conservancy, of course, the Sierra Fund sponsored that bill. He did a bunch of other stuff, um, which I'm not going to declaim because it wasn't all our idea. Um, but that all being said, um, Laird has prioritized climate change and adaptation 
water conservation and supply reliability, these enhanced relationships with tribal governments, state parks access, farmland conservation, and ocean sustainability. Mr. Laird, come on up. Thank you, Izzy. Unless I missed it, she made it sound like the public service was in the past tense. <laughs> so I'm, We're still doing it every I'm day. I'm trying huh? to still do it. And uh, that was a great presentation by Gideon because he and the staff have really turned the corner, I think, on some of the mining issues. But what I was sort of grappling with doing here is trying to figure out how to look at a high level about the challenges and put some of the things into context that you have been talking about and maybe talk about some of the opportunities that present themselves. Because I was looking at uh, some of the posters here and seeing what people were uh, working on and presenting and it's, I think it's tough sometimes because you see such an intense problem in such a localized area and it's like, how does it fit in a scheme? Does anybody really care about it? Is there some overall strategy for dealing with it? And if you're from the Sierra, I suspect you ask that question every day. And I thought maybe one way to talk about this would be uh, as resources secretary, I go all over the state and I start to stitch together uh, impacts both in two ways. Uh, one is, is what are the impacts of just sort of resource extraction in the development of California in the last couple of hundred years where nobody cared about sustainability in any way? And then what's the overlay with climate change that is happening? And then what presents us some opportunities against those challenges? Because one of the interesting things, you heard about mining. And I'm sure when people were doing some of this in the 1800s and into the 1900s, they had no idea at the legacy with which we would be dealing with them uh, right now in the 21st century. And if you look at fishing on the coast, uh, we have the largest network of marine protected areas almost off of any of the, uh, of the United States, in part <clears throat> because of overfishing and the effects of climate and the fact that we would like to leave something for future generations that remotely was what existed in the past. And if you look at the Delta, um, it was just this incredible mixing of rivers when Europeans arrived in California, uh, not below sea level, not levied uh, different in different ways. And it was really armored and farmed, so it's dropped. Uh, in sea level, some of the so-called Delta Islands are 20, 25 feet uh, below sea level. You look at the Los Angeles River around where Gideon uh, lives and operates and what's happened to that over time. It's paved in some places. It's not anywhere near the original thing. You look at the aquifers in California and how they have just been uh, overdrafted, mostly by Brian Dolly, who just walked in. Uh, um, but yeah, and so the thing is, is, is the legislature really was forced to act because in the ocean areas or coastal areas, sea water is intruding under the 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 soil where uh, excessive extraction's been done, and some of the farming areas. If you look at the NASA satellites. Uh, during the drought and what happened in the San Joaquin Valley, the subsidence that's even affecting the aqueducts. And then uh, one of the things I had to do early on uh, was in the Sierra and was the fact that Nevada wanted to pull out of the Tahoe Compact. <clears throat> and I did round-the-clock negotiations over six or eight months. We did the first general plan up there in 25 years. They gradually backed off. And then in the course of it, we created a two-state panel to just look at the science of Lake Tahoe. And Nevada was maybe rightfully concerned because they thought they were going to be forced to do things they didn't want to do. But shouldn't we do it based on some actual scientific knowledge? And 
with my Nevada counterpart. I'm chairing this at the time of the Tahoe Summit last year. And in the section where people are just talking back and forth, and this is before we had a, a heavy precipitation season, they pointed out that Lake Tahoe generally survives on the cold water that melts from the snow. It goes to the bottom. It helps the circulation. <clears throat> it deals with the health of the lake. And that basically, in the drought, uh, only warm water was going in. It was only going to the surface. And that Lake Tahoe was warming faster than any freshwater lake in the world. And how do we measure the health of Lake Tahoe? With a Secchi dish, where the last person that sees it off the boat declares that they've seen it, and we look at what the level of sedimentation and clarity is, and that's how we measure it year to year. It's not in temperature, it's not in invasives, it's not in just its health in resulting from some of those changes. And so the climate seems to be affecting places all over California with the overlay of sort of extraction and just the development that happened uh, in the last couple hundred years. And our challenge is to sort of try to reclaim, given the title of this conference, and restore and bring people into it and get it back to a healthy level that's more sustainable. What an amazingly clear thing to say and what an amazingly hard thing to do. And so uh, we are trying in so many different ways. And when, when we did the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, and I would just say for the record, if you're ever in a political gang fight, you want Izzy standing right next to you. That's the only way to, to work your way through it. Um, we really sort of said this is the first time people in the Sierra have a seat at the table on statewide issues. It will guide resources to the Sierra, but it actually allowed us to tell a story. And I mean, one of the many ones is my family happened to have a place in Alpine County for over 40 years. And one of the things that I would say at hearings that I love about going up there is that once you've been there a while, you hear the wind uh, before it gets to you. And it's like, where in California can you usually say that? And we seem hell-bent on shutting down places like that rather than expanding them or, or getting to where we should deal with it. And now we have these challenges, and we have the challenges in the Sierra. We had 102 million dead trees. We've dealt with 2 million of them. They've been prioritized for public safety next to urbanized areas for fire next to power lines and the power grid, or next to roads. And as I've been educated, not everyone's a fire hazard, depending on, on at what level they deteriorate or what level uh, uh, they exist. And we have to figure out uh, how we're going to deal with that. And we're having to figure out the fact that with our climate, like we kicked off Fire Awareness Week earlier today, and it's kind of amazing because in the last month, we've had nine times as many acres burned as burned in the same month a year ago, which nobody would suspect given the amount of rain that has happened. But it's led to grassland fires and places where there's fuel that didn't exist. Our fire season, according to studies at UC Merced, over the last 20 to 30 years is expanded by a series of weeks into months on each end of the season. And even though we just had the wettest year in modern California history, it's going to be like that going forward. And how do we adjust? Now, the governor has really tried to focus on climate. And he's tried to focus on climate, particularly with the cap and trade, to move resources into places to try to deal with this in terms of carbon sequestration. But the trouble is, is how you tell the story about the Sierra to the larger part of California in a way that they hear it. They understand they're connected to it. 
obviously with mining and mercury, if it's in your drinking water uh, uh, or it's coming into more urbanized areas, it's an issue. Um, but if you um, have fires, it's an issue. If you have wetlands that have not been restored and not been anywhere that, uh, uh, the way they were when Europeans arrived in California, you're dealing with a water system that's interconnected with a watershed. Uh, 25 million Californians get their water coming out of the Sierra, what the Sierra originated, and including 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture. And if we don't have restored wetlands there, that's resilience against climate, it's resili resilience against fire, it deals well with the water system, and it's a story you can tell to people in other parts of the state in a way that they see their interest in it and see that they have to invest. And I think part of the challenge, it was identified in some of the work of the Sierra Fund, is the Sierra are so unpopulated that you have Brian Dolly, you have uh, a second assembly member, you might have one senator, and the question is, is how do you interest people in the other state, to, uh, other parts of the state to adopt the Sierra and connect to it so that political decisions are made that uh, really you sort of deal with the reclamation of the Sierra, but with the fact that 2% of California lives there, or whatever it is. How do you connect it to other people? And I personally, of course, by authoring the Sierra Conservancy, by being far away from the Sierra in a legislative district, I did what the ideal situation is, is that you have some people from other parts of the state adopt issues or places of the Sierra, engage in the legislative package, do it, and I think that's our challenge, is always making sure that there are those connections, that there are people that want to do that, uh, that they uh, connect into it. And I think, you know, we've been lucky um, that that has happened, but a lot of the people that have been advocates, Rich Gordon is one, have been termed out, and we have to have new people that come in behind them. Fran Pavley was the advocate for Lake Tahoe. She termed out who's going to come in <clears throat> behind her. And then there are the economic challenges, which is the economy was really based in this year a lot on resource extraction. Uh, that has been cut back. Um, there are real issues. And when I was at the dedication of the uh, Sierra Buttes, where some land was purchased about lost track two, three, or four years ago, we're all up there. And some of the people from the Bay Area, from the podium, with the Sierra County supervisors uh, present, said, oh, well, we just had to fight the local elected officials, and this is really hard. And, you know, congratulations to us, we did this while they were there. And I found myself in the awkward position of standing up heralding the fact that we were pro protecting the Sierra Buttes, but saying we have removed their traditional economy and something else isn't there yet, and yet if anybody would come and see this, it would probably be something that would be a boost to the local economy, and it doesn't need to be forced on people. There has to be a way that people expect it, it transitions, they see the opportunities, and they feel like they're part of the decisions in a way uh, that's very important. Thus, the conservancy, because it really sort of brings people to a seat at the table and you can talk about it. So I think that, um, y you know, enough of that. She. Izzy said she was going to deal with this like it was David Letterman, and I didn't know how you were going to talk about some of these issues with David Letterman, but what I wanted to do is just say with cap and trade, we have an opportunity of bringing money to the Sierra. With really engendering people from other parts of the state, we can really try to move the politics. With telling stories so that we really let people understand how they connect to the Sierra, whether it's water or mercury or air or carbon sequestration, there's a way that this ties together and people realize that doing the right thing is in their interest. There's some economics to it. We can work it out with people. We're, we're issuing a forest carbon plan in the next few months to really try to offer that as economic opportunities, but be the basis for the 
uh, uh, some of the cap and trade or carbon sequestration that is available from doing that. So I think I will just decide that Izzy's going to ask a few questions. It's time to quit, but I really challenge you to get involved in that struggle because there's a lot we can do. We've had successes, but there's many more in our future. Thank you, John Laird. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, we seem to have captured another uh, elected. Uh, Brian Dolly's floating about. He's going to give a, an award here, but I can't help but notice that Mr. Cooley, the assembly member from this area, has also come in and he's taking pictures of things. So perhaps we're, we're bringing more in. I just wanted to ask you, um, John, if you I could... I think he's a crime scene photographer. Oh, I know. I, I thought that's... something was going on back there. I just wanted to ask you, um, John, if you were to give the Sierra Fund one piece of advice about what we could do, what would it be? Well, it's tough because it would do more of what you're already doing, which is being totally entrepreneurial. It is really identifying those issues and seeing where the opportunities. I mean, who would have thought some of the things you've done on suction dredge mining or restoring of trails or uh, mercury and mining would get somewhere, but you sort of really highlighted what the issues were and you looked for the opportunities, whether they were opportunities in grants and funding, whether there were opportunities in telling the stories, whether they're political opportunities, incorporating people into getting involved in it. I think that's really the answer. And it's like I always tell, I've had a very checkered career on the way to here. And one of the things I did is I ran an aid service agency at the height of the epidemic. I was never more entrepreneurial in fundraising and grants than anything I ever did. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, I hope it's not endangered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swat the thing in a minute. Uh, um, and it, it, when I did that, it's like I had three grant funders for social workers all convinced that they were the funders of last resort because I had to have those social workers and I had to have them funded and I had to figure out how to get the job done. And it's sort of, that's the same with all these issues. And it's like, how do you make sure that people get the passion and the urgency and the opportunities and how do you move resources to it? And it's really looking for any opportunity to do it that you have. And Gideon, do you, would you like to take a cut at now that he said that, what you think are best? You know, we, we hold this conference for one reason and one reason only. We, we don't hold it every year. We hold it when we're ready, when we have, first of all, things, things we think that people need to know about, when there's new research, and when we, we have kind of, we're ready to hear what people think we should do next. So, Gideon, do you have one, one last uh, drop of advice? I'm just happy uh, to be on the same uh, David Letterman couch as Secretary <laughs> Laird here. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm just a city slicker from L.A., so I, right, I'm Gideon. learning all this stuff. I was, when he was talking about, um, you know, what would it take to get the folks from the urban areas involved, I was thinking if they could just all go on a, a trip with you uh, through the Sierras. I don't know how much time you have uh, for that, but it's so valuable um, to go and, and see the, really the threads, um, you know, of our history, uh, you know, of a state, uh, you know, of our state and it's such an education, um, but unless folks are, are getting out there, you know, they're really not gonna, gonna see that. Um, you know, my um, focus is a little bit more parochial than, you know, than secretaries here. Um, what I'm very excited to see is, is how the work that you're doing, um, which sort of this combination of policy, science, and passion on the mercury uh, issue. I know you're looking at the state budget right now um, and picking a few projects trying to be really smart about how that money is applied. Um, but I think a lot of folks throughout the state are, are looking at this mercury issue. It's an issue that affects a lot of folks um, uh, of all incomes in our state. So um, I think picking a few of these issues, and this one in particular, um, and scrambling to get the resources for it, uh, trying to be strategic in how the money is applied, and then showing some results um, it's very exciting, and a lot of folks are going to be looking at it. Well, well, thank you, you two. I like to think of us as not less scrambling and more gracefully dancing, perhaps to jazz music, as we, or we did, did earlier today. I'd like to thank you both for coming out this evening and giving us your best, uh, your be best ideas. We, the, I think one of the best ideas we've ever had was, uh, I've ever had, was to hire 
Carrie Monahan <laughs> to be our science director. Um, yay. She's coming up next.